All right, this is chapter 13, section 1 for causes of World War I. Hopefully you can hear this because I can see the little buttons, the little dots moving, showing that you can pick up my voice, which is odd if you can't hear my voice because I've been told I'm loud. All right, moving on. All right, the Great War, World War I, the Great War, often called the war to end all wars, which is funny. Um, but at the time, of course, they referred to it as the Great War because there was no World War II, so they're not going to call it World War I. But there's a lot of factors that lead to World War I. And um, as it says, it's a conflict that devastates Europe and has a major impact on the world. And um, as we saw in some of these videos, it didn't even need to happen. Most of these guys didn't even know why they were fighting. So marching toward war, um, you have military buildup, nationalistic feelings, and um, rival alliance systems that are what make this not just the European continent, but a world war. Rising tensions in Europe. Now, the first thing you need to understand is nationalism. Um, Europe's relatively peaceful at this point. There's hasn't been any sort of real major warfare since the Napoleonic Wars. Um, since the 1800s, things have been nice and calm within Europe. Now, if you were, you know, uh, in India or some African area that the Europeans decided they wanted, well, things was, you know, less calm and less nice. But within Europe itself, everybody was so busy running around in different places in the globe that they weren't fighting with each other for once. So things look great in Europe for now. But because you need a strong and well-equipped um, and large army, an industrialized army to go ahead and, you know, beat down the Zulu nation or, you know, take over and, and kick out the Boers in South Africa or, or subdue most of uh, the continent or most of the area of, of India, um, you have these highly... Um, militaristic uh, societies and because of that people start to you know believe that they're awesome um, this growing nationalism leads to competition among the nations if you want to think of an analogy for nationalism think about um, the way most Americans kind of feel on the 4th of July where you know everybody's eating their potato salad and watching fireworks and singing the national anthem, and everybody feels real patriotic. And if you take that feeling and multiply it times like 50 or 100 and make it every day, that's what nationalism was in the 1800s. People really believed that might made right and um, their country was strong and therefore if their country could take you over, they should take you over, um, and that their country was the best country and deserved whatever it wanted. Um, nationalism is sort of defined in, in your textbook as like pride in one's country and a desire for independence and greatness. And it doesn't just apply to countries with borders. This is also countries like, or uh, not countries, but um, groups of people that share a common ethnicity. And that's where we're going to get into trouble with the Balkans. Um, also, two other isms that you need to know about, one you already should know about, is imperialism and militarism. Um, that along with, those two along with nationalism are what get us into all this trouble. Um, you've got this competition for colonies, you know, imperialism, uh, within Africa where hopefully you remember in Africa there was only, you know, by the 1900s, there was only two places in Africa that weren't controlled by European countries. You should know where they are. Um, so you have this imperialism and you're building up your army so that you can go take over these areas and you're trying to get there faster than your European neighbor. And this is going to, you know, create some animosity and some problems between some of the European countries and trying to vie for power and etc. And in order to get more colonies, you're building up your army. And this lends itself to this policy called militarism, which, you know, we looked at today. And militarism is this policy of glorifying military power, preparing your army for the war that you felt was coming, and essentially basing your country's uh, worth and greatness solely on your military might. Okay, so here is a chart looking at the increase in expenditures. Um, Germany increased its spending on the military by 73% compared to 
Okay, Britain by 13%, Russia by 39%. So everybody is pouring more and more money into their military. So some of the early alliances. Well, if you remember, Otto von Bismarck is the guy who engineered a war with France, the Franco-Prussian War. And he did that to make all the little German principalities choose a side. You know, you need to choose a side. Are you going to be on the French side or you'd be with us, your German brothers? And of course, you know, all the German principalities in the Holy Roman Empire chose to be with their, quote, German brothers and joined up with Prussia. And that's how he created the country of Germany, which remember, hopefully from chapter eight, that he then remarkably handed it over to the Kaiser of Germany. Is like, here you go. Here's a country with a bow on it. Have a good time, um, which he did. Um, so Bismarck had engineered this war over nothing, really. Um, and so after Germany has been founded and, uh, and is getting relatively strong, Bismarck's main foreign policy concern is to make sure that France doesn't try to exact revenge for that Franco-Prussian war, which France lost, by the way, um, and, and to make sure that France doesn't try to attack this newly formed country of Germany, even though Prussia is militarily awesome, he doesn't want to have to go through that war. So he really starts basing his entire foreign policy, and, you know, the Kaiser of Germany is basically sitting back and letting him run the country, but um, he bases the entire foreign policy of Germany on isolating France. And so he kind of creates this I hate France club. First, he signs a treaty in 1881 with Russia, which is easy because the, uh, the Kaiser of Germany and the Tsar of Russia are cousins. So, you know, family connection, and that's always good. And then he signs what's called the Triple Alliance, which is Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy in 1882. So you've got Russia, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, and they're all in the I Hate France Club. So if you're France, you're starting to get a little nervous. Okay, you're looking for friends. So the Triple Alliance works out to be this. You've got um, up at the top, that's Germany. Okay, then you have Austria-Hungary. And then that next flag down there. Does my cursor show up? No. Okay, and then you have that next flag down at the bottom, that's Italy. And it's versus with a triple entente, who we'll get to in a moment. But that top flag is Great Britain. And then you have France. Okay, and then you have Russia down at the bottom. So we already went over that. Why was that there twice? I don't know. All right. Um, now, in 1888, the old Kaiser dies, the one who was the Kaiser when Bismarck formed the country and handed it over. And so his son takes over, and his son is a total idiot. Um, he is an arrogant Nimrod, really. Um, and so he basically starts to saying, you know, I don't want Bismarck to run the country for me. I'm going to run my own country. And Bismarck's just a crazy old man. So in 1890, he fires Bismarck, which was stupid on his part. Uh, but he fires Bismarck and he lets the alliance with his cousin, the Tsar of Russia, he lets that sort of fall. He doesn't renew it. Um, and Russia now feels like they're left out of the I Hate France Club. And, you know, whenever anyone is isolated, they're going to start looking around for friends, and that's exactly what they do. And, well, you know, lo and behold, who's the only other person standing all by themselves? It's France. So Russia develops a friendship and signs an alliance with France. And then uh, Wilhelm II decides that he's going to strengthen the German Navy. He wants an awesome Navy. Well, that's the smart thing that Bismarck never did. He never did anything with the Navy. Everything he did was based on land because he knew the minute he starts building up a Navy, he's going to start um, generating bad feelings between Germany and Britain. So when Wilhelm II starts building up his Navy, this starts to freak out Great Britain, who's like, wait a minute, what are you doing? Are you going to try to attack us? What are you What's your plan here? And so this could puts Britain sort of on edge. France and Russia already have a little agreement. And so together they form the Triple Entente. Um, and it, that happens in 1907. And the Entente is not as strong as the Triple Alliance. Um, the Triple Alliance is a, hey, I've got your back, bro, kind of thing. The Triple Entente is more of a kind of, yeah, I don't hate you so much. Please don't 
make me come to your aid because I'd rather not, you know, kind of thing. So here you go. Here's all the conscripting circles and feel free to pause it and take a look. And it uh, shows you, you know, who was friends because someone gave someone money, who was friends because they signed an, a treaty at one point, or who was friends because they had just a flat out strong alliance. All right, now we've talked about all the major European countries, but really where this all goes down is a place called the Balkans. The Balkans are um, like north of Greece. Um, you know, you look it up on your map, but this is the area that's north of Greece and just across the Adriatic from Italy. This is Montenegro, Albania, um, and this area called Bosnia and Herzegovina. And um, this whole area is known as the Balkans. And in the early 1900s, a lot of these groups had won their independence, including this uh, group of this ethnic group of people known as Serbians. And they had successfully broken away from Austria Hungary. Austria Hungary used to control them. Now, all the Serbs did not break away, some of the Serbs were still stuck. Okay, um, and so they formed the country of Serbia, but there's lots of places that are in like Romania, that are in, um, you know, parts of Albania and Bosnia that are all ethnically Serbian people. So in 1908, Austria-Hungary goes into one of those areas and essentially sits down, they annex it, they take it over, um, and that area is called Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, now, when this happens, Serbia is really pissed off. And they're not pissed off on behalf of the Bosnians. They're not saying, you know, Bosnia should have its freedom. They should form their own country. No, 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 no. But, you know, Serbia wants Bosnia to be part of their country. Um, that will make Serbia bigger. It will make Serbia more powerful. But most of the people within Bosnia are Serbs anyways. So, you know, this is something they feel is rightfully theirs. So in June of 1914, okay, the um, emperor monarch, the emperor king of, of uh, Austria-Hungary, Franz Joseph, sends his heir to the throne, who is actually not his son because his son died, is actually his, I think it's his nephew, um, sends his, his nephew, his heir to the throne, a guy named Franz Ferdinand, yes, that's where the band name came from, um, he sends his nephew and his wife, Franz Ferdinand's wife, Okay, Sophie, um, sends the two of them a sort of on a goodwill tour of you, as you will, of, um, of Bosnia, this land that they've recently taken over. You know, how much goodwill they think they're going to generate when they've essentially invaded and taken over, I don't know, but he doesn't anyways. So um, Franz Ferdinand and Sophie go, you know, cruising through um, the streets of Sarajevo, which is the capital or sort of the major city in Bosnia. And their sort of, you know, plan is to sort of generate happiness amongst the people or, you know, be seen and whatever. And of course, as we know, what happens is there is a Serbian group, which may or may not have been sponsored by the government. Of course, Austria feels they were sponsored by the government. Serbia, of course, says they were not sponsored by the Serbian government. But it is a group of Serbian militants who want to see Bosnia return to Serbia. And they come over from Serbia into Bosnia. And this group is known as the Black Hand. Um, it's basically a terrorist group. Uh, and so they believe, or their job, or what they think they're going to do is, is assassinate the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and that will cause chaos, and the pe they believe the people of Bosnia will rise up in an armed rebellion and overthrow Austria-Hungary and rejoin Serbia and, you know, this blaze of glory and it'll all be awesome. Um, well, you know, long story short, the first assassination attempt is crap. Um, he throws a bomb, it bounces off the car and blows up a bunch of bystanders and some guards, so... It doesn't actually hurt the Archduke or his wife at all. Um, and then later, as the Archduke and his wife are driving through the, are being driven through the streets, they decide to go to the hospital to visit the guards that were injured in the initial um, assassination attempt. Their chauffeur, who no one knows his name, and, you know, this is a name we should know as a thanks for nothing, um, he turns down the wrong street. It's a, it's a dead-end street, and he has to slow down and back up. And as he's doing that... One of the other Black Hand members, a guy named Gavrilo Princip, 
is standing right there. And he sees the Archduke and his wife, and they're right there in front of him, and he just pulls out his gun and he shoots them both. When he does this, oh, and they die. Like, you know, it's 1914. People die when they get shot. So when he does this, Austria essentially issues an ultimatum to Serbia and says, look, we know that even though this happened in Bosnia, we know that you're responsible. And this terrorist group, the Black Hand, is responsible. We're going to give you this list of ultimatums. And you need to fulfill them all, or we're going to declare war on you. Keep in mind, Austria-Hungary, ancient, massive empire. Serbia, pretty small. So um, Serbia says yes to all the demands except for one. Okay, The one demand that pretty much no country can say yes to. Austria-Hungary um, demands the right to come in there and to investigate members of the Serbian government because they believe that the Serbian government is really funding and, and um, supporting this terrorist group, the Black Hand, which they might have been, but whatever. No country is going to say, yeah, come on in, invest our uh, investigate our government, and then um, arrest our, our government officials, put them on trial and put them in jail. You, you might as well throw up your hands and say, we're not a country anymore. So, of course, Serbia says no to that. When that happens, Austria declares war on Serbia. Now, this is like a... This is like a senior picking on a seventh grader. So, of course, you know, Serbia is like, wait, we're small. We're a fairly new country. This isn't fair. But they're Slavic people, remember? And so they go to the old, longtime defender of the Slavic people, which is Russia. So they go knocking on their big brother Slav's door in Russia, and they say, you know, this isn't fair. You can't, you're not going to let him beat me up, are you? And Russia says, well, no, that wouldn't be fair. You're right. Okay, so they go over to Austria-Hungary and say, you need to stop it. You can't be picking on little Serbia. That's my little brother there. And Austria-Hungary is like, holy crap, it's Russia. They're massive. I need help. And they look at their alliance and they say, wait a minute, my best friend is Germany. And so they knock on Germany's door and Germany's like, yeah, I got your back, bro. Okay, so now Russia's looking around like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> what's going on? And Germany is assessing the situation and realizing if they attack Aus or if they attack Serbia, Russia's going to attack them. And Russia and France have an alliance. So if Russia attacks Germany, Germany's eventually going to end up at war with France anyway. So what do they do? Well, they just declare war on France. Problem solved. So that is the spark. Okay. Um, the Balkans are often referred to as the powder keg of Europe, you know, a keg of gunpowder. And, um, the assassination of, there they are, Franz Ferdinand and um, the Archduchess Sophie is considered the spark. So there you go. Here's a map. You've got the Adriatic down there, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, okay? And all of these are little ethnicities, little ethnic groups. you got Hungary, um, you know, Slovenia, Austria, uh, Slovakia, and all of these were controlled by Austria. Okay, Ruthenia, which is Romania, Transylvania, okay, uh, or okay, sorry, Ruthenia is Ruthenia, Romania is down there. Um, I need like a pointer. Um, so there you go. You know, these are all Slavic peoples, except for the Austrians and the Hungarians. And here's Archduke, and he was shot in Sarajevo through the chest. All right, now when you're thinking about the causes of World War I, remember mania, okay? Uh, World War I was mania! World War I mania! Okay, M for militarism, A for alliances, N for nationalism, I for imperialism. Those were all the things that were there. And then A, mania, the last A is that assassination that sends it all over the edge.